Hello everyone, welcome 138 MMA here for another full card breakdown video. In this video, we're going to break down Bellator 292 from start to finish, cover every single fight on the card. Um, real quick, hey, if this is your first time here, welcome. I'm sure glad you found the channel. We do this every time there's a fight card coming up, whether it's Bellator or UFC. So maybe stick around if you enjoy my content. We'll, we'll find out later in the video. Now, if you're coming back to this video or to these videos because you've seen some of my other videos, hey, welcome back. I'm super happy to have you again. Real quick, also, you can find me on Twitter and on Tapology 138 mma Go figure. That's the name. Uh, you can find me there if you want to check out all my stuff, whether it's my, my tweets during the fights or my, my predictions record on Tapology. One last disclaimer before we get into this. I do apologize if you guys hear gunshots in the background. Uh, like that, on cue. Someone's shooting just down the road from me. Um, it's just what happens. I live in the middle of nowhere, and uh, sometimes you get that around here. So... Sorry if that interrupts the video at all. I don't know how much you can hear of it, but it's there. Anyway, let's not waste any more time. Let's get into these fights, and let's get going right after this. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, 138 MMA proudly brings to you the hottest picks in the world. All right, so we kick off the card in the welterweight division with a couple of O&O prospects. I don't have anything to go off of here. I've got a little bit. I did check out their amateur fights, or at least what I could find. So I don't have a ton to go off of here. We have Dimitri, I can't pronounce his last name, uh, against Dupree Stewart. Uh, this is going to be an interesting one because it's really hard to know what we're going to get. Um, I believe Dimitri was 2-2 two and two in, in his amateur career and 5-0 and oh for Stewart. I could be wrong about that, but I believe that's what it was. The amateur level is really hard to go off of, though, because I don't know if you guys go to any local MMA or, like, regional MMA, but I go to quite a few because where I live, there happens to be, like, a handful of... of different levels of local promoters and regional promoters uh and at the lower level in amateurs which is a lot of times you're you're local like based in that city they don't really go out of that city they just put on fights in that city there's some horrible talent so a guy can put together a 5-0 and record against guys that didn't train they've never trained in their life but they watch they watch ufc on tv and they're like yeah, I could probably get in there and do that. And then they get in there and they just are terrible because they've never trained in their entire life. They don't even exercise and they're just, they're just bad. So you get some of that. And because in certain states, they just give anybody a, a fight license. I happen to live in a state where you pretty much, it's pretty hard to not get one. So um, basically if you got 25 bucks, you can get a fight license. I hope they don't, the commission doesn't see this and get mad at me, but that's the truth. Either way, in this matchup here though, we're going off of their amateur records. So don't put any money on this fight. You're a degenerate if you do. You're crazy, okay? Um, I'm going to lean with Stewart. He does appear to have some pretty good grappling skills. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I'm just making a pick for the sake of a pick. I, I'll, I'll say he probably gets the sub or something like that. But, like I said, 5-0 and oh on the amateur scene, you really can't go off of that. So, that's where I'm at. Let me know what you guys think. Let's go to the I have not fight. noticed yet. This is a very top-heavy card. Some of the prelim fights are a little bit odd um low level you know not even five fights in their career guys and uh there's some setup fights along the way as well and in this one we have adam wamsley taking on theo haig now theo haig is 1-0 um he i broke down his uh, last fight but there uh, you know there wasn't much to go off of because he was 0-0 at the time now he's 1-0 taking on the 2-2 and -2 wamsley now for wamsley there was it was hard to find a lot of good footage for him i watched some off of a cell phone that was then uh screen recorded but like yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It was weird. I watched some weird footage for, for Wamsley here, but from what I could tell, striking's okay. Um, his offensive grappling's okay, uh, but he struggles off his, he struggles defensively with grapplers, whether that be, you know, in the takedowns and the, you know, off of his back, things like that. So he's low level. I mean, he's two and two as a pro. He's not a terrible fighter, but he's not a good fighter by any means. Uh, he's obviously being brought in to lose. So uh, they have Theo Egg here, who's Kind of a prospect that Bellator's trying to build. You know how they do that. Um, you know they, they they bring in these guys that don't have a record. They want to do. They want to make another AJ McKee is what they want to do. So they want to find a couple of guys that are like coming on. You know from a good background. His happens to be a wrestling background, and they want to build them up from the beginning and try to get them to that that level of status that AJ McKee had. They're playing the long game here. So he does have the wrestling background. He's got strong grappling. He should win because he's being brought in to win against a guy that's being brought in to lose. But I don't know if you remember, it wasn't that long ago, Pat Downey was supposed to win as well. 
And he did not. And he did not look good. And he got wrecked. And he got knocked out by a guy that was like, what, 2-2 two and two or 2-4 two and four or something like that? So guess what? Don't play this fight because we just don't know yet. We don't have a big enough sample size. I think Theo Hag's going to get the win. I'm going to pick him because, well, that's what Bellator is, is trying to set up here. But I'm not confident in it. He's going to be a mass, massive favorite, probably minus 800 or so, because it's clear Bellator wants him to win. So don't waste your money. I'm taking Hag. Let me know what you guys got. Let's go to the next fight. Oh, Bellator. Here we are in the heavyweight division. We've got Sean Tucker taking on Vladimir Govea. Ah, so where to begin? So this matchup here, we have Sean Tucker coming in one and three in his last only fights, his only four fights, and one and zero oh for Govea. Now I I know nobody's picking Sean Tucker in this matchup, and a lot of people are going to start throwing Govea in their parlays. And please just don't do it. Let me talk you through this one before you make any crazy decisions. If after that I haven't convinced you that it's a bad one and you should just leave this off your cards, then go ahead and do whatever you want. But I'm going to try to I'm going to try to save you from accidentally busting a parlay by just getting overly excited about a big favorite sean tucker yeah he's being brought in to lose he should lose this fight he's one in three he's he, he shouldn't win i'm sure he's a decent guy i'm not trying to bash on him but come on he's being brought in to lose we all know this govea his first fight he was had another opponent who's being brought in to lose govea does have a jujitsu background as well as a boxing background and uh you know they, bellator does this so they can build up these prospects right they want to get him some wins so that they have like a nice shiny 8 or 9 and 0 record when they start putting him in there against some guys that have, you know, a decent level. Govea here in his first matchup, yes, he won that fight and he showed a good jab, but the rest of his striking was horrible. I've seen untrained middle-aged housewives doing kickboxing fitness to have better striking than this dude outside of his jab. He just wings these wild punches that have no form to them whatsoever other than uh, you know, like those noodly arm waving blow up things. It's terrible. It's, it was not good, but he does have a nice jab. I don't know how he can have a good jab and everything else sucks, but it's the way it is. Yeah, jujitsu background, I guess. Um, I don't know. Not much to go off of there. Here's the thing, though. This guy did not look that good over a guy that was being brought in to lose. Yeah, he won, but mm. Sean Tucker, he's being brought in to lose as well, but clearly he's won before. And if he wins in this one, I won't be that surprised. Now, I'm not going to bet Sean Tucker. I'm not dumb. Sean Tucker's being brought in to lose, like I said. But I'm not going to bet on Govea either because this is silly. This is silly and Bill Tour's being silly. All right? Just watch this fight. See if you see something. Maybe we can fade Govea down the road. Or maybe we don't get the chance because Sean Tucker puts him out of there and we're like, well, okay, well, that was a wasted effort for uh, Bill Tour. And Sean Tucker gets a win on his record. Who knows? Leave it off. I'm taking Govea for the sake of a pick. I'm not confident in it at all, but let me know what you guys think. Oh, there's a fight here without a lot to go off of, but we're in the featherweight division with uh, Rogelio uh, Luna taking on Laird Anderson. 1-0 versus 3-0. Like I said, not a lot to go off of here, but I did the best that I could to find what I could in their matchups. And thankfully that, thankfully for Luna's matchup, it was, it was quite an exciting matchup, so there was a lot to kind of kind of take apart, and maybe that's how he's going to fight in this fight, but maybe not. Maybe none of this is going to make any sense. Um, and then for, for Anderson, he's had three fights now. So we've got a somewhat of a decent sample size, but not enough to really get into it. So bear with me if some of the things have changed drastically. And you'll actually see that on the Anderson side based on the video I did on him in his last fight. Anyway, so Anderson here, he's 5'7 with a 65-inch reach. So he's much uh, much shorter with a shorter reach than most opponents he's going to fight. Basically, the 65-inch reach is very short. The 5'7 is kind of normal, a little under normal at five at 145. Uh, for the Luna side, he's 5'9", 70 and a half inch reach. So he is going to be able to reach Anderson much before uh, Anderson can reach Luna. This matchup here is going to be interesting because Luna is a very fast starter. So fast starter with a bit of a reach, and he's going to be looked look to be active in his striking. The volume is probably his biggest asset. Um, but he looks to brawl, move forward with his punches, and just go. He has a good chin that can hold up, and that's great because his striking defense is horrible. He just lets you hit him in the face. D his his uh, defense is just to throw more punches and hope he can overwhelm you, at least from that first fight. Um, and it was a very exciting fight. If you haven't seen it, go back and watch it. It was very good. Um, but yeah, the, it was very entertaining. It wasn't like super technical or anything like that. But uh, but no, it was very entertaining. Luna was a, was a fun fight to watch. Um, but anyway, the volume, the forward pressure with the punches, just getting into a brawl is going to be a, a very bad time for Anderson because Anderson's striking is very basic and he also has horrible striking defense, um, at least from what we've seen in his three fights so far. He's clearly more of a grappler. 
Well, that's interesting because Luna is not so good on the ground. Thankfully, he has very good cardio and can w and wait out around, hopefully, and just survive. Um, but, you know, he does not look super good on the ground, at least based on that first fight, especially because he was going up against a guy who was 0-1 and, and uh, you know, didn't look good on his, on his back. So there's that. Now, for the grappling of Anderson, his takedowns have improved because if you, if you watched my video uh, breaking down his last fight, I said he didn't have very good takedowns. But in that matchup, he was, they're still not good, good, but like he was able to show, you know, a, an improvement in his takedown ability, which goes great here because he is a good grappler. It's just, if you can't get it to the mat, it doesn't matter how good of a grappler you are, but it's improving. So that's good. Um, but he does look to land really heavy ground and pound once he gets the fight to the mat, which could be trouble for Luna. But he often gives up some space, some pretty big space when he go, postures up, starts trying to land that heavy ground and pound. And that can be a problem. I don't think it will be against Luna, who didn't really show me anything off of his back. So um, I'm going to take Anderson here. I think that he's going to be able to get the fight to the ground. I don't think the takedown defense is really there for Luna from what I saw in the first matchup. So I'm going to think Anderson can get it to the ground. If he can't, then this fight's going to go the other way, most likely, because he can't strike. Um, at least not well. And so I think Anderson's going to get this fight to the ground. I think he's going to land some crown and pound. Potentially just get the ref to stop in because Luna's just absorbing strikes and not really doing much. So that's what I'm thinking. Probably a TKO for Anderson. Let me know what you guys think, and I'll Got see you. A ton next to go off of in our next fight here. We're in the bantamweight division with a couple of guys really new to their career and their professional career. That is, um, we have Alberto Garcia taking on Bobby uh, Ceronio the uh, third. So for Ceronio and Garcia, both of them do have a common opponent in Pimbert. Now Pimbert. Um, not that good. Uh, kind of just a low-level guy. In fact, both of their competition has been pretty low-level. But because of that common opponent, I do feel confident in my pick here. Um, not as confident as I should be because, you know, like, like I said, there's only five fights between the two of them. But I feel a little better about it. But on the Garcia side, he does have decent wrestling, and that is, of course, what he used to beat Pimbert. Um, on the uh, Seronio side, same deal. Decent wrestling. Used that to beat Pimbert. Uh, Seronio does seem to be a bit of a faster starter. And the striking, he did use that a little bit in, in some of his matchups. He really likes that lead leg sidekick for creating distance. And he likes to follow it up with the heavy one too. Big, long, straight shot. Um, but realistically, he's looking for the wrestling. And he likes the big slams, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Uh, those big slams take it out of both guys. The guy getting slammed, obviously, he gets the damage of being slammed. The guy doing the slamming often wears himself out. So it depends on if you can hurt your opponent with the slam or not. Sometimes you do. Sometimes it just doesn't hurt. And then the guy that picked you up just wasted a bunch of energy. So, um, but in this matchup here, basically, I'm going to breeze through this. The thing that I'm going to base this on is how they handled Pimber. And the reason why is because we just don't have much else to go on. And their competition level is very low, like I said. Basically, uh, Seronio beat Pimber much easier than Garcia did. Uh, Garcia was in, in trouble a few times. Almost got submitted by uh, by Pimbert in a few situations. Um, nothing super dangerous to him, but definitely struggled more. So for me, the pick Seronio, I feel pretty good about it. I feel like uh, that uh, Bellator wants to push this guy, so I'm going to go with him. Let me know what you guys think down below because ah, I don't have a ton to go off of. Maybe you know one of these guys or something. I don't know. Let me know what you got. I'll go to the next like Heavyweight, we've got, I can't pronounce his first name to save my life, Yagshamiradov taking on Julius, Julius Anglicus. In this matchup here, sorry, I can't, I don't even know how to start with that other than it starts with a D. Um, anyway, both of these guys are three and two in their last fights, uh, last five fights. Um, six foot three with a 77 inch reach is going to be a pretty big reach and height advantage over the 5'11", 72 inch reach of Yagshit Muradov. This one here is going to be interesting to me because I don't really know, I don't really have a good read on Yagshit Muradov because he's kind of just like, I don't know, he wins fights, but like, I don't really know. I can't gauge what level he is. It's really tough because when, when he fights the lower level guys, he beats them pretty easily. But when he fights the high level guys, he gets beat pretty easily. Um, and it's a tough one for me to gauge. So he does have decent striking and clearly has some KO power. He does have 12 KOs in his career, um, some from ground and pound, some from on the feet. Um, but they're all at a lower level. Um, and he's very low volume at times. A lot of times they just kind of like hang out not really do anything and then just explode one real quick one just kind of go back to hanging out not doing much um he does have a good sambo background and he does really well on top but he got absolutely dominated when Corey anderson got on top of him so like i said like when he gets in there with the higher level guys he can't hold his own whatsoever because anderson made him look bad on the feet and on the ground and i know anderson's one of the top guys in bellator but it, he just ragged all the poor guy um on the other side for anglicus 
Um, he was a hot young prospect coming in, you know, doing his thing, getting up the rankings. And then he hit a rough patch, uh, kind of similar, where he got to the top level guys and they started beating on him pretty bad. Um, but he does have very good boxing. The jab is, his jab is very accurate, uh, very technical. It sets up a laser of a one-two. After he hits you with that jab enough, that one-two just comes down like super straight, super accurate, lands just about every time right through the guard. Um, so he does very well there. Like I said, he's accurate and technical with his boxing. That's probably his best attribute. And I know that he came into MMA as a wrestler, um, but his boxing is now much better than his wrestling, in my opinion. Like I said, though, he does have decent wrestling, and his sprawl is actually pretty good initially. However, if you can get past his initial sprawl, he does struggle with higher-level grapplers when he gets on his back. Um, so there is a path to victory for uh, Yagshimuradov. If he can get on top of Anglicus, he doesn't really do as well there. Um, Nem Nemkov, for example, absolutely just handled the guy on the ground. Now, I understand Nemkov is very, very talented. Um, so in that respect, obviously, we got Corey Anderson uh, beating Yagshimuradov. Nemkov beating Inglikas. Those are the top guys. But the thing that that bothers me is they didn't they didn't look good at all. Like they just got handled. Uh, so so neither guy looks like they're going to be able to excel to that top level. And we're just trying to now figure out where they fall in the in the tier. Okay, where do they fall in the in the rankings? Um, and for me, I have a really hard time with this one. More on the Yagshimuradov side. I'm going to lean Inglikas in this fight for his activity level. I think he's going to be more active in the boxing. Um, he does have a pretty sizable height and reach, and he's going to be able to land shots on Yagshimurdov uh, more often than, than the alternative. But if Yagshimurdov gets on top of Anglicus, I think Anglicus is going to struggle to get back to his feet, at least consistently. Um, I just, the lower volume, the lower output, I think I'm going to lean Anglicus here. Not my most confident pick of the night, just because, like I said, I don't really have a good read on where these guys actually are going to fall. But Anglica should get it done. Let me know what you think. Let's we go find ourselves fight. at middleweight with Tony Johnson taking on Halid Murtazaliv. I think that's how you say that. Uh, bear with me. Um, but hey, if you've made it this far in the video and you're still enjoying yourself, go ahead and hit that like button for me. I appreciate it very much. And if you found this helpful so far, maybe consider subscribing to help you find these videos as they come out. But let's get right back to this video. So in this matchup, both guys, four and one in their last five. The age discrepancy is definitely in favor of Murtazaliv. He is 29 as opposed to the 39 on the Johnson side. Johnson does have a bit of a height and reach advantage, though. He is 6'2 with a 77-inch reach as opposed to the 6'72 and a half-inch reach for Murtazaliv. Um, I think I'm, I might be butchering that name. Sorry about that. Uh, usually I'm better at the names. I didn't take time to go through and do the the, uh, the pronunciations like I, I do. But, ah, it was a tough one. I was rushing to make the, get this video out. Anyway, in this matchup here, we have Tony Johnson, who is a very talented boxer. Uh, so much so that I think his boxing is going to be much better than Murtaza leave. He does strike in combination. Um, he works well behind the jab. He'll set things up with the feints. Um, after he's jabbed you in the face quite a few times, that when he throws that cross, finally, it lands with some some uh, some sting to it. Um, he does circle off well, which is good against, against wrestlers because you don't want to get pushed up against the cage and taken down by them. Um, and his boxing defense is very, very good. But he struggles very much with wrestlers. His takedown defense is not there. In his last fight, though, he did show improved ability to get back up to his feet when taken down. But if you keep getting taken down, getting back up doesn't help because, I mean, it helps, but it doesn't it doesn't save you from the fight because you're constantly getting taken down. And that's not what you want to see uh, for Tony Johnson if you're if you're looking for the Tony Johnson side. For Matazaliv, he is a good wrestler. So obviously that is a kryptonite there. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and make the make the line here, shall we? So obviously that is something that we're gonna be looking at. Um, in this matchup here, he does have solid takedowns, and once he does get the fight to the ground, that ground and pound is very, very, very good. Uh, he's gonna he's gonna cut some, get some damage going on his opponents with the ground and pound, and that's usually what you're gonna see out of out of Murtazali. His striking is decent though. Um, he does have some power, uh, particularly with his body kick. His body kick to typically to the open side of the opponent. Um, he can put that that shot right in there, um, hit you right in the gut when you're when you're you know not expecting it. And here's the thing about a body kick now. If you can catch somebody when they're... So so when you expel air, you can tighten your core and you can take that body kick pretty well. But when you're breathing in and somebody hits you as you're breathing in, they're going to knock the wind out of you. He has shown in the past the ability to time that and catch somebody on an in-breath 
and land that body kick. And that I do really like because when you hit that, when you hit that body kick and somebody's breathing in, that wind gets knocked out of you pretty nasty. And uh, I don't know any of you guys that have ever been hit in the stomach while you're trying to breathe in, it, it takes it out of you pretty fast. So um, with the kicks though, he recently has shown the ability to start letting the accumulation of leg kicks build up as well. And against a boxer, that's typically a good strategy because boxers are often heavier on their front leg because they'll sit down on their jab, they'll come through with their heavy cross, but they're they're very punch focused, so they're typically more uh, more heavy on the front leg. So um, for this matchup, I think it's just a, a case of the style that is going to make this one a, a simple pick for me. So I'm going to go with uh, Murtaza Leave. I think the style in this matchup is just going to favor him more so than the Johnson side. Johnson does have good boxing, like I said, and if this ends up being a boxing match, uh, Johnson's going to win no problem, but I just don't think it will. So there's the pick. You got it. Here's Let's the fight the I'm looking fight. forward to. Here in the Bantamweight division, we have Josh Hill taking on Cass Bell. Both guys 3-2 and two in their last five. And we've got Cass Bell with the weirdest height to reach. He's 5'10 with a 67-inch reach. He's got those short, stubby little arms. Um, he's taking on Josh Hill, who still will have a shorter reach because he's just shorter, 5'6", 66 and a half inch reach. Now, those of you who have been around the channel for a while know that Cass Bell did us a big favor as an underdog in his last matchup, and he came in big for us, and we won some money. So I do like Cass Bell, but I'm going to try to put that aside and break down this fight as fairly as I can, okay? So in this one here, both guys are pretty good wrestlers. For Cass Bell, his grappling, once he gets onto the ground, it's those choking arms that are his good thing for him. He's able to scramble, get positions, whatever. But those choking arms are his biggest weapon on the ground because they're just these weird skinny little arms that he has. So anyway, he's 5'10", that's what happens. Uh, so on the other side, we've got a guy who's more, he's going to look for his takedown entries under his opponent's strikes, which is going to be weird against a guy like Cass Bell because he strikes kind of awkward. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but he's going to look to enter his takedowns underneath his opponent's strikes. When he gets on top of the opponent, he does have very good top control. That is where uh, Josh Hill typically excels is in his top control. But he's also a decent boxer, and I think that's set up because of the takedown threat. He's able to kind of feint the takedown and work his hands up top. He keeps a nice high guard, um, so that's nice. Uh, strikes can get through the guard, don't get me wrong, but, but he does a good job at kind of uh, protecting himself in the fight. Now for, uh, for Cass Bell... The dude puts a good pace on his opponents, and I think that helps him well, especially because he does have a very awkward movement and striking style. So for Bell, that that striking, like that awkward movement and striking, I think it's going to be tough for the entries on the takedowns of Hill, especially going against a guy like Bell who is a good wrestler. But if Hill gets on top of Cass Bell, I don't think Cass Bell is going to be able to get back up very easily. So there is that. Um, just strike for strike, I don't really know how this is going to go because we have the more traditional style striking in the boxing he will throw a leg kick here and there don't get me wrong but like uh it's typically a, a nice solid boxing very 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 uh traditional boxing style of punching whereas you got caspell who's moving around all wild throwing weird stuff so uh, but it, i guess it works for him so i don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing the thing that that has me interested here is because josh hill obviously he's a much more experienced guy but which is weird because both guys are about the same age. One's like 36, one's 35. So both kind of older for the division, but he has so much more experience. And for a guy at this experience level in his last matchup, he was completely outclassed by a guy that was making his Bellator debut, I do believe. He was just completely outclassed. Didn't look like he belonged there whatsoever. And I don't really know yet if that's because Josh Hill has started to go downward uh, in his in his ability, or if it's because this guy was coming in, you know, making his debut with a big splash and going to rise to the top. Now, that's the thing. I think Josh Hill might be just slipping just a tiny bit. And Josh Hill's a big favorite in this matchup, too, I do believe. And as much as I want to just push it out of my out of my mind, I'm leaning to Cass Bell to come in and get us as a dog again. Am I right, guys? Cass Bell, that's my pick. Uh, let me know what you guys think. I don't think he's going to get the finish. I do think it's going to go to decision. But I think Cass Bell is going to do enough to get that win. Let me know what you guys think. Is Cass Bell, are we riding with him again? Or is Josh Hill just too much of a step up in competition for him? I'd love to hear your opinion down in the comments below. And let's go right, to we've got a match of another one that's pretty tough for me to predict here. We're in the bantamweight division. We have Eric Perez taking on Enrique Barzola. Barzola 2-2 in a draw in his last five. 3-2 for Perez. 
This one's tough for me to predict, and I'll tell you why here in a second. But uh, in this one here, both guys are, excel in the ground and pound, but for different reasons. Uh, for Perez, his grappling's pretty good. If he gets on top of you, he can work that well. And the volume with his ground and pound is where it's at. He's raining down elbows typically, and those elbows will cause a lot of damage. So for Perez, that's kind of his best best area from what I can gather. Um, his striking is decent. He has active hands. They're always just kind of kind of doing something, which is good for getting your opponent to, to you know kind of think about what's coming next, but also good for just your hands being somewhere to defend, which is which is better than having your hands down by your waist. Um, the problem is he short arms his punches. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it before, but like, you know, when someone goes to throw a cross, it should be out, but he'll kind of lean in and throw his cross like this. I don't know if you can see this very well, but where his arms like this, and this is where it hits. It's just not a good, good way to throw a punch. Uh, you end up losing a lot of power because your arm has too much give to it, as opposed to when it's out here and extended and it doesn't have as much give to it. And you can give it a little more zip at the end of that punch. Um, so I don't like that, uh, but it's de his technique is decent anyway. He's going to land on you a little bit, but um, there's that. On the Barzola side, uh, he's also a good, uh, he's really also good in the ground and pound department, but it's typically because he's going to drop you with a counter shot because Barzola is a good counter striker. And I think he's going to have good success on the feet against Perez with his counter striking. But the problem is he can get backed up while he's looking to counter. He'll get back straight up into the cage and that's not what you want. And he also gets rattled when he's pressured. Uh, you see, he just kind of doesn't react right when he's pressed when he's pressed against. So like when someone's coming up at, um, at him with aggressive forward pressure, he doesn't really react well. And I don't really know. It's not every time, but it's it's enough that makes me wonder about it. And I don't know what's going on there. So um, for a guy that's had this many fights, you would think that he wouldn't react that way, but he kind of does. And I don't know if it's something that he developed along the way or what. Uh, but either way, it's there. In this matchup, though, for the sake of a pick, I'm going to take Barzola. I do think he's going to be able to get the counter striking going off of a guy who, yeah, he has active hands, but he's going to he's going to short arm some punches and get himself countered. And I do think that's going to help help out. So I think Barzola is going to get it there. Not confident in this pick whatsoever. I don't I don't know. I don't feel good about this one. But uh, let me know what you guys think. Maybe you guys can help me uh, help me out get to a better conclusion. Get to feel a little bit better about my pick, or maybe sway me on the other side because this one is, is another one I don't feel good about. But let me know what you guys think, and I'll see Wait, you in the real next quick, one. Real quick, just a reminder, hey, if you're enjoying this content, go ahead and like this video for me. I really do appreciate it, and it shows me that you like it, so that's very nice. Also, if you're enjoying this content and you want to see more of this, maybe subscribe to the video. It'll help you out. It'll help me out. It helps the channel grow, but it really helps you because you can find all my videos right there when you click on me on the side of your screen or at the top of your screen or wherever it may be, depending on what device you're watching it on. But there it is. So let's get into this fight here because this one's one I'm really excited about. We're in the welterweight division with Yamaguchi, Goiti Yamaguchi, taking on Michael Venom Page. This one here, both guys 4-1 and one in their last five fights. Both are very talented fighters. Um, there's a bit of an age here by five. It's not a big deal typically because, you know, it's five years. But Page is at 35, so there is that. 34 Yamaguchi. So in this one here, though, MVP does have a bit of a height and reach advantage. He's 6'3 with 79-inch reach, 5'10 with a 74-inch reach for Yamaguchi. Now, <clears throat> this matchup basically is going to depend on who's who gets the fight where they want. This one here, we have Yamaguchi, who is very high level in his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He has excellent submissions, 21 of them in his career out of his 28 wins, which is crazy. Um, and he does have some solid body locks and trip takedowns to get the fight to the mat. Decent striking, don't get me wrong, but this is just not the fight to strike. So he's going to want to get this to the mat and use that jujitsu Because if he does, Paige is in trouble and he's not going to get up. So when, once this fight gets to the mat, Yamaguchi has the, the advantage and will most likely get the submission. However, we have MVP, who is a very high-level kickboxer with high-level karate background. He does have very good KO power. We've seen him drop a lot of people and just put people out. We saw that jumping knee that took out um, Evangelista Santos and dented his forehead in, made it so he can never fight again. Um, he's also very fast, light, like lightning fast, but for that matter. Um, his striking defense is done by controlling the range, and because he's so tall and lanky, a lot of guys have a hard time closing that gap. And he will make his opponents very hesitant by... What he does is gives them so many things to look at and so many things to think about where the attack coming from that they're kind of hesitant because they don't know how to react, especially with his bait and counter style. He'll give you what you think you want to see and then counter you. Um, he did he does this in a few fights where he can get guys to you know flinch and he'll get them to kind of duck under a strike and then think they're going to go for a takedown. And then what he does is because he then backs out, he times that a few times and hits that flying knee because those flying knees he does very, very well. 
Um, and they're just they're straight up. He doesn't he doesn't double clutch, nothing. He just straight up. I can't do that or I will knock stuff over right here. Um, but there's that. So so the striking, super high level for MVP. His takedown defense is pretty good too over his over the course of his career. Obviously, he's only got two losses, one of which I don't actually think he lost. I think he won the Storley fight, but it was very close. But I think he won the Storley fight. But that fight is what I bring that up because that's what we're going to talk about real quick. Storley was able to get him to the ground, but it wasn't easy. MVP was able to, to work his way with range off of a few takedowns, circle off to the side and get away. He did that quite a few times. Storley eventually got on top. And when he did, he didn't really have an answer. Page didn't have an answer, that is. MVP was not able to get back up off the mat. He was just kind of stuck there. Um, kind of worked his way to the cage, tried to work his way up, but he just there was it was to no avail. So I think it's going to be similar in this matchup. Who gets the fight to where they want it? And for me... Because this fight's going to start on the feet and a guy like MVP who's so quick, I think he's going to get it done. I'm going to take MVP. He's probably going to get the knockout because he is devastating when he hits you. I'm leaning that way. Uh, I don't know what the odds are. Uh, so whether I bet it or not, would I'd have to get him at a dog price to bet him because otherwise it's too close for my, for my taste. So I'm taking MVP, but I could see this fight going the other way, especially if it ends up on the mat at any point. But let me know what you think. And I'll match here in the heavyweight division. We have Linton Vassell taking on Valentin Moldavsky. Uh, both of these guys obviously are four and one in their last, or well, three one and one with a no, or three one and one no contest in his last five. Um, but four and one in his last five for Zell. Both guys obviously doing well. They're on a similar trajectory, but they have fought before back in 2019. So this is a rematch. Uh, we have the younger fighter, who is 31, that's Bol uh, Moldovsky, taking on the 39-year-old Vassell. Neither guy's really too old for the heavyweight division, but I'm pointing it out anyway because it's an eight-year age gap. Um, Moldovsky 6'1 with a 75-inch reach, which is going to be quite a bit shorter. Um, with <laughs> That says 8.5-inch reach. I'm pretty sure it's 80 and a half. Let me double-check that. Yeah, 80-and-a-half-inch reach. Hold on. There we go. Whoops. He's 6'4 with an 80 and a half inch reach uh, for Vassell. I think this fight's going to go much like it did in the first one, which is a very close fight. So don't get me wrong, it was a close fight. If you haven't seen it, go back and watch it and it'll give you a better idea of what you're going to see in this one is from my perspective. Um, but for Lin Vassell, he is a good wrestler. He uses kind of his power to bully his opponents. Um, he does have some nasty ground and pound once he gets on top of you and he will do that with his powerful takedowns. Striking on the feet, basically just a powerful guy, throws hands, does decently well, decent boxing, whatever, but his cardio tends to fade, and he's, he's had that problem throughout pretty much his whole career. On the other side, obviously, Moldovsky won the first fight, so there is that. He does have decent striking. He's very efficient with his striking, and he's quick, but he has to overcome an 80 inch, 80 and a half inch reach that uh, Vassal has, which is obviously going to be a challenge, and it was in the first fight as well, so his striking never really got going, but he does have a strong Sambo background. He can get you to the ground with a decent level of takedown efficiency, but once he gets you down, he grinds on the opponent, looking for the finish, but grinds on them while he does it. And if he does end up on his back, like in the first fight, he will work to get back up, whether it's successful or not, he's gonna make Vassell work. So what's likely to happen here? Vassell's gonna win the first round, second round's gonna be razor close, and uh, Moldovsky's gonna win the third. Well, that's what happened in the, in the first fight, and Moldovsky got the win. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna lean Moldovsky here. I think it makes sense. Um, I'm not mega confident in it. Vassal could come out here and, uh, and get the finish in the first round, but I don't think so. I think it's going to very much like it did in the first one. So let me know what you guys think. I've got Moldovsky here and, uh, let's go what I'd say is my favorite matchup on the card. The one I'm most looking forward to. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is my kick your feet up on the coffee table, crack open a couple of cold root beers and just enjoy type of matchup because I don't think I could bet on this one because this is a razor close matchup, but I'm going to break it down for you in case maybe that's what you want to do. So in this one here, we have Alexander Shabley taking on Tofik Moseyev, I think is how you say these. I'm struggling with the names today, guys. I'm sorry, but 4-1 and one in his last five for Moseyev. And uh, for Shabley, he's 5-0 and oh in his last five. Both guys with very impressive records. Obviously, 22-3 and three as opposed to 20-4. and four. Both guys really, really got it done leading into this matchup. Um, for Shabley, I'm going to start with him. He does have very strong grappling. He, he has a very large toolbox when it gets to the mat. He can mix in just about every type of submission, going for the chokes, going for the arms, going for the heel hooks. He had back-to-back -back heel hook wins somewhere in his career. I watched those. It was very, very interesting. Um, and to get it to the mat, he likes to work with his trips um, as well as kind of like um, trips and kind of like tosses or whatever. That's his best way to get the fight to the mat aside from just landing a shot and dropping you because he also does that quite a bit. Um, 
with the striking, he's a very aggressive striker, the knees are his most deadly weapon. In fact, most of his fights, not, not most, but a lot of his fights end with a knee to a ground and pound. So you'll see him hit the, the, either the flying knee or a counter knee off of a takedown attempt or whatever, hits the knee, guy falls to the mat, and he falls up with that nasty ground and pound, and he's, he's right on top of it. But um, he, does have, he is a good counter striker as well. He's able to hit the cross off of the fake takedown setup, and he, he used that to quite a bit of success against Brent Primus. Uh, and he does have power when he lands, as you can tell by his knockouts in his career. He's got quite a few of them. Uh, the thing that concerns me a little is that Brent Primus, who obviously a top-level guy in Bellator, but he was able to start landing shots on Shabley at a pretty good pace or a pretty good clip. Uh, once he started to match the aggression, it was just too little too late for Primus. He didn't start doing that till the second round. But when he did, he started to land. So something to take note of. On the other side, Moseyev, darn good striker. Um, he, he actually outstruck Patriki Pitbull, which is pretty impressive because Patriki's not a bad striker. I mean, he's not Patricio, don't get me wrong, but he's still a good striker. Um, and he was able to do that with his combinations and his counter striking ability. The volume, though, is what's going to help out most for Moseyev here. He does have a pretty darn good output, and he doesn't ever seem to get tired. I should have wrote that down. I didn't. Whoops. Um, he did. Plane going over the top of me. Oh, well. Anyway, good wrestling on the side of uh, Moseyev. Uh, he, he likes to mix the takedowns in with his striking, but it's not really his go-to. He's, in fact, going to want to usually use that striking to piece up his opponents, but he'll mix those in just to get it. Um, and then he has solid ground and pound when it does get there. The thing that he does best with his wrestling, though, is he uses it defensively. That's what I think is going to be his path to victory here, and that's why I'm picking Maseev in this fight, is because I think he's able to use his wrestling defensively and keep this on the feet, and I think he's going to be able to use that volume to do what Primus should have been able to do from the beginning but didn't, and get that, that volume to match the aggressive aggression of Shabley, get the counters going, get those combinations going, um, and just realistically, I think he's going to be able to kind of put a pace on Shabley that I don't think Shabley can keep up with, now, there is a possibility that Shabley gets the knee, drops Maseyev with that, and then we have a problem for Maseyev. That's, that's why, like I said, get your feet up on the coffee table, drink your root beers, call it a good night. I'm taking Maseyev here, but not confident. This is going to be a fun one, though. Let me know what you guys think, and let's head to the next fight. Right, and here it is. It is our main event of the evening, and this is the last reminder. Go like this video if you've enjoyed yourself so far. You're still here, so go ahead and do that for me, would you? Um, if you enjoy this, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. You can see all my videos as they come out. It's going to be great. We're going to have a good time together. So go and do that stuff for me, would you? And do it, do yourself a favor so that way you can find my videos whenever they come out. Now, we have got Benson Henderson, one of the greatest of all time. I don't care what anybody says. He is one of the greatest of all time. He has taken on Usman Nurmagomedov, who is young in his career, but making a good account of himself so far at 16-0. and So in this one here, though, 5-0 in the last five for Nurmagomedov, 3-2 and two for Benson Henderson. And at the age of 39, being 3-2 and two in his last five, fighting the top of the top level guys in Bellator, that's a pretty good feat. In this one here, though, we've got a couple of really high-level guys, and high-level grappling is something that Benson Henderson is, is kind of known for, okay? He has top-tier defensive grappling. Submitting this guy is dang near impossible. He gets out of everything. You, get, you can have a choke full in, all the way, deep as can be. You think the guy's going to go out, next thing you know... Dude's out of it. Just got out of it and reversed the position. That's what he does. He reverses the position every time. And he's just so darn good at it. And he's got a nasty guillotine of his own. Now, when it comes to his wrestling, his takedowns can come at just about any time. And he's very good with the wrestling. So you're, you're striking with the guy and you think that that's what's going on. Well, guess what? He's going to drop really low. Like his butt almost hits the ground when he drops down for that takedown. Shoots under whatever you've got going on. Gets a hold of your legs. Brings you to the mat. Very good wrestling. Uh, I mean, good is probably not the best word. I probably should have been higher. Um, and his striking is also excellent. So the guy's got great combinations. He works all levels, especially with his kicks. And Benson Henderson has some of the better kicks in, in the history of mixed martial arts as far as, you know, as far as guys at, at, at the, band, or at the uh, um, lightweight division. Sorry. The lightweight division, he's probably one of the better kickers that there has been. Here's the thing about Benson Henderson, though. He's also very durable, and he's had experience fighting some of the highest level guys. So when you know that a guy like this is very durable, because he's hard to put away. But he's getting older, and he seems to have lost just a little bit of the himself. Now, he's still, he's still able to compete, and he's pulled the upset a few times, although some of those were questionable, but he's pulled the upset a few times over some big favorites, and he's a massive, massive underdog in this one. I believe it's like minus 1,000 or something like that, probably more, like, ridiculous over a guy like Benson Henderson, 
because you never know, and this dude can pull an upset on somebody. Now, when we got Nurmagomedov on the other, other side, yeah, he's young, he's hungry, he wants to be the champion for a long time to come. He has very high-level grappling. His control, his minute-winning ability is there. Now, can he do that to a guy like Benson Henderson? That's yet to be seen. We're going to find out. But he does have solid takedowns, and he chains those takedowns together. He has very good chain wrestling, if you will. Striking, he's good at range as well. He works the kicks in, mostly his kicks, but he can throw punches. He's not he's not completely lost in the boxing, but his kicks are where it's at, similar to Benson Henderson. The kicks are the the better part of his striking game. Um, and he controls the range very well to keep at kicking range unless he wants to get the takedown. Now, he does push a really, really high pace, and that's what a lot of his opponents are going to struggle with because the pace that he puts on a guy is going to wear them out, and he's just not going to get tired ever. Uh, well, maybe ever, but maybe not ever, but he will, he will get tired eventually. He does not get tired in an MMA fight. In 25 minutes, he's not getting tired. Let's put it that way. So for this one here, this is tough because we have Nurmagomedov who has all the skills. He has everything you look for in a hot young prospect, 24 years of age with undefeated at 16-0 with all these skills, right? But you're going against a guy who's 30 and 11 at 39 years old. Darn good record. Three and two in the last five. He's fought the who's who. It, it, not only the lightweight division, but he's also fought at welterweight and fought some tough guys up there. And made a good account of himself for being a guy that's not the biggest lightweight there is. I mean, he's not small, but he's not the biggest lightweight there is. So the guy, Benson Henderson, can, can really just, he can topple a lot of parlays. So this is another one where I'm going to say, hey, Kick your feet up on the coffee table. Crack open a couple of cold root beers. We're probably going to be four to six root beers deep by this point. Don't get me wrong. But let's crack open a couple more and just watch this fight because you're not getting much by throwing Uzman Nurmagomedov in your parlay at minus 1,000. Benson Henderson can topple that parlay no problem because this guy's tricky. And when he decides to show up, you know what? You don't know what you're going to get. He might get the, the Benson Henderson of old, and he might just pull this one out of his hat because there's title, uh, title implications on the line. Wow, that was tough to say. There are title implications on the line. I'm going to pick Usman Nurmagomedov because I think Benson Henderson has just lost a little bit in his game. But like I said, I'm just going to watch this one, drink my root beers, and have a good time because this is going to be a good main event. This is going to be a fun one to watch. And I would love to, I'd love to get your opinion. Do you think I'm crazy for thinking this is just a watchable fight and that the odds are crazy? Do you think Usman Nurmagomedov is going to win this fight no problem? Or do you think Benson Henderson is going to win this fight? You love those dog odds and you're throwing some money on it. So I'd love to hear your opinion. I would really like to hear, see you guys down in the comments with all of your picks. Let me know what you're thinking. Like the video. I know it was the last time, but like the video. And I'll see you guys next week. Or I'll see you over in my UFC breakdown that's coming out on Tuesday. See you there. Talk to you soon. Have a good time.